favorite Sundays of Advent. Uh, this is the one unique candle that uh, that we have on the Advent wreath, and I get to light it today. You'll have to forgive the, the chaos of, of the week. We are finally getting everything settled, but today is the candle of joy. Uh, the angels uh, proclaimed Jesus' birth, and we sing Joy to the World, which is the, our next uh, song. So uh, today this single pink candle represents the joy that we all have in the season of Advent as we celebrate the birth of Jesus and his, all, his having already come, and we look forward to the day when he will come again. And the Bible says that, as we looked at last week, that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord through the glory of God the Father. That's a, a great thing and something we can take great joy in, but... Again, we're thankful for each of you uh, being able to be here with us today, and I hope that you've had a, a good week. And uh, I've been getting used to everything, and finally got the last load from Lenore yesterday, so praise God for that. <laughs> uh, that has been one of the uh, most difficult things, but I may have said this last week, but moving kind of makes you... Uh, hate moving and hate yourself at the same time for acquiring all that junk. <laughs> so uh, we are definitely thankful, and thankful for all of you and, and how kind uh, you've been and, and uh, welcoming and the calls, stopping by and, and all that kind of thing. We just It's been a good week. Uh, but uh, we do have several uh, things that I, I hope that you're looking forward to. Uh, this is the time, the season of the year when we uh, collect our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. This specifically goes uh, toward our cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention and specifically international missions. We have missionaries on the field uh, in uh, almost every country of the world. And there are many who are in closed nations that put their lives on the line uh, to, to share. Uh, share the gospel, so I hope that you will prayerfully think about how you can give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and uh, uh, and be praying about that as we try to do this during the month of December. Um, we also, uh, and I have a few extra flyers here, uh, the, the Christmas Eve meal. Uh, make sure that you spread the word about this. I know it's, it's expanded a little bit. We're trying to, to do more with it this year. Uh, from what I've been told, so there are going to be some some uh, new faces. It's a good opportunity to get up close to people, and that's what ministry is. Uh, we don't minister from a distance. We, we minister uh, by, by getting near and getting close to people and fellowshipping with them, also uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus. So uh, if you would like one of those uh, flyers, I invite you to uh, grab that. Um, I want to ask uh, if there's anything that anyone has we can pray for specifically uh, this morning, are there any prayer concerns that you'd like to make mention of? Um, one of the girls that I work with, her name's Roxanne Tart. Her son, Emmanuel, um, was run over and struck by a car and was killed Tuesday night. He's 18 years old. So let's remember that family. What was her last name again? Tart. T A R T. So it's Roxanne Tart, Tart mm -hmm. son Emmanuel, that was struck by a car and killed this week. Are there any others that you'd like to make mention of? <coughs> My brother in law, Dale Williamson. Dale Williamson? Yes. He, um, Got a doctor's appointment coming up in January. Um, they found out that he had nail bladder cancer. He struggled with cancer for like about almost 14 years, but found out he has bladder cancer, and I think they're very, very concerned about that, what that might lead to. So. Yeah. Yeah. Brad, what happened? He, he's good. He had a, he had a horse last night. Oh, but he, he's okay. Yeah, he's okay. And the horse ended up, I think the horse is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That's something to do with your grandkids about. Now watch out just for deer around here. Yeah. Watch out for deer. My gracious. All right, let me well, We're going to pray for these requests. We're also going to pray for God to work in our, our service today. Uh, just 
Help us in the days to come. So let's bow our heads together and pray. Our Father, we come before you acknowledging your position as the author, the creator of all things. Father, you are, are sovereign over all that is and all that ever will be. Father, we praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Father, we're thankful that you are our refuge, our peace, our place of hope. Father, I pray that we would turn our hearts toward you this day. Father, we lift up these requests. Father, we lift up uh, Roxanne's heart and her family as they are dealing with the loss of, of a son. Father, what, what, a, what a hard and uh, beyond words difficult thing to endure. Lord, we pray for your hand to be upon that family, for you to provide peace that passes understanding. Father, we pray for Dale Williamson. We pray, Father, that you would give wisdom to doctors and nurses entrusted with his care. Father, we pray that uh, you would give him uh, courage, that you would give him peace, give his family that same courage and peace as they face the unknown. Lord, none of us can understand, uh, unless we've been there, what it means to hear the word cancer and a diagnosis such as that. And Father, there are many in our community that are dealing with this great burden. And Father, we, we just ask that you would move. Father, we pray for healing. We pray, Father, that you would eliminate uh, this sickness from the bodies of these people. And Father, we pray that whether that healing comes in, uh, in the form of medicine and doctors, or if it comes supernaturally, Father, we just say that we will give you glory for all that you do. Father, I pray that as we gathered in this place today, we hear of all the, the uh, turmoil in our world. I pray that we would lay aside every thought, every care, every fear, every inhibition that would stand in the way of our worship. And let us know what it is to draw close to you. Your word says, if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. And Father, we pray today that our hearts would reach for you. And that our, uh, our, our entire person would ready itself to receive from you. Father, I pray that not one word that is spoken would be displeasing in your sight. But that everything would be done to the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ and him alone. It's in his great name that we pray. Amen. We're going to sing one of my favorite uh, Christmas songs, Joy to the World. So I hope that you will stand up and let's sing together Joy to the World. The world. I'm not a very good music for it. So we're just going to take our cues from Miss Hill. She knows what she's doing.
thank you for that. And if uh, you'll remain, well, go ahead and be seated. No, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Randy Coleman, I'm going to pray for us this morning. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for this day and all the things you have given us. Let us sit here, Father, and bless us and shut in. Help us. Help us. You can help us over this virus if you want. And you can. And you will. And Father, just, just lead and guide us and help us do sight, say the right thing, and bless us too. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. We'll sing another great hymn of Christmas while shepherds watch their flocks. <laughs>
probably say a great big yes when we mentioned the movie uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, 1964, I believe that uh, was released, and it has been played every year since its release multiple times during uh, the Christmas uh, season. And Burl Ives narrates. He kind of became the voice of Christmas uh, by accident. But uh, uh, it's a movie that throughout my childhood, and probably many of yours, uh, kind of uh, told you that Christmas was coming. It was that and Frosty the Snowman, and uh, it's Christmas Charlie Brown, or whatever, Charlie Brown Christmas, and all that kind of thing. But uh, in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, uh, you uh, see this little reindeer, Rudolph, born to, to Donner and, and his wife, and uh, you watch the story of Rudolph, and eventually he ends up at the Isle of Misfit Toys, the island of Misfit Toys, and all of these toys have something broken, something something busted, when you get right down to it, about, about them, and uh, because of that, they're hidden away there on that place, and and uh, Rudolph had, had run away to uh, to uh, that eventually find himself on that island because he was somebody who everybody thought had something wrong with them and that he was useless, you know. Uh, we kind of live in a culture like that where uh, when we've got our bumps and bruises and sometimes our missing pieces and whatever else uh, that comes along life's way, uh, the world, the culture tells you to hide it, tells you uh, either that or, or get, out of, get out of sight, you know. Uh, but when we read the Word of God, we see that the Bible does not whitewash, it does not do away with the deficiencies of people. Uh, the Bible puts on full displays the victories and the failures of, of individuals. Uh, King David was a man after God's own heart, but the Bible doesn't just highlight uh, the, the positives in David's life. But the Bible, God's Word, makes very clear that David though he was called a man after God's own heart, was a failure at different times in his life. But as we think about Christmas and we think about uh, the meaning of Christmas, last week with the hanging of the greens, we, we, we talked about how Christmas is, is really a time where we turn our hearts toward the purpose, the work of Jesus Christ. But when we read Matthew chapter 1, we see how God brought Jesus about how how Mary was born. You you get in in the book of Luke the the uh, the uh, the fathers uh, his earthly father Joseph's lineage, but here in Matthew you get his maternal lineage, and this is something also that lends its credibility and or, or lends credibility to the Bible because the custom. Uh, in uh, scriptural days, the custom in, in Eastern culture was not to uh, list women in a genealogy, but it was to only list men. But when you read the, the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, you see several women and several men, all of them imperfect, that God used to bring about the greatest event in human history, and that was the birth of Jesus Christ. So when when we talk about uh, Christmas and we think about those, those uh, great symbols of Christmas and we think about the uh, island of misfit toys as we watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which ultimately ends with all those toys leaving the island, Santa Claus finding homes for them, ultimately it brings us to the reality and it makes us think about uh, ourselves and how it is that we are misfits in some way, shape, or form. But when we look at the Gospel of Matthew and the genealogy that we find here, I just want to give you some, some highlights. We're not going to go through every person in the genealogy. We're not going to read the entirety of the genealogy. But I want to give you some highlights of the kind of people that God used that God orchestrated in time and eternity to bring about the birth of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. If, when we read uh, the Gospel of Matthew, I, we see four women specifically. We're going to go with them first because ladies first. That's always how, how Mama said it anyway. Uh, 
Uh, but when we read this, this gospel, we see Rahab. Rahab, we remember as, as the children of Israel were coming into the promised land, they came to what city? Come on. Jericho. Jericho. And Rahab hid the, the spies that had come from the children of Israel. And Rahab was known not as a stand-up individual in her community, but Rahab was called a harlot. Which means she was a prostitute. Someone who was on the outskirts of her culture, but because she was faithful, because she, she chose the right path, God pres not only preserved her life, but placed her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. When we read the lineage of, of kings and queens in our own world, you don't hear about, about their the, the rotten aspects, you might say, of their, uh, of their lineage. We, we've all got a family member or two that we don't quite want to claim, don't we? There's one in every family. But the scripture does more than just claim them. They put it on full display. These people, you've got Rahab, a prostitute, a harlot. She is forever known as Rahab the harlot. But she is so much more than that. You've got Ruth. Ruth, a, a woman without a place, a widow, a foreigner, an outcast, looking for a place to belong. You got Tamar. That's one messed up story. You know, if we think that our families have have some messed up circumstances, you think about Tamar and Judah. Solomon. There's four of them. Excuse me. Beth, Bathsheba, who was labeled an adulteress. You, you've got Tamar, you've got Bathsheba. Ultimately, Solomon would come through David's lineage. As we see four, four women, look at four men. Solomon, a polygamist. He started really well. He started really well. He was, he was faithful. He was wise. He was all of these things. He was entrusted with the building of the temple at Jerusalem. But he ended poorly. He built the temple. But at the same time that he's building the temple of the Most High God, the Bible says that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. read that in 1 Kings. Many of his consorts, and see this was ultimately Solomon's downfall. You see those four women and you begin, and, and I'm not going in order with these, but you see that Solomon as he's building the temple of the Most High God, this guy who started well, he allows all of this, this uh, paganism to, to be propped up and, and built up in the kingdom of Israel. He ends poorly. You go back to David's father. Or Solomon's father, David. David was a rapist in many senses. David abused his position of power. To entice a woman who was married to someone else. And then murder her husband. That fits, that fits the, the description of a misfit. It fits the description of a vastly imperfect individual. You read the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. You, you read the genealogy that's provided for us in Scripture, and you see the names of some of the greatest and some of the most depraved individuals that ever walked the face of the earth. David was a man after God's own heart, but he was a sinner. 
You see the name Manasseh. Manasseh, one of the most evil kings in the history of Israel. The Bible says of him he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did practices that God detests, the scripture said. He worshipped false gods. He worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars, everything but God. While his, his father's and his, grand, his father, his grandfather, they had seen God's blessing, Manasseh, embrace paganism. You got Judah. Go back to Tamar. You got Tamar, who's wrapped up in this story, ultimately, who had been lied to. She had been left. Penniless and without position in the world because Judah and his children would not fulfill their obligation to her. And so Tamar uh, disguises herself as a prostitute. And she entices her father-in-law and ultimately she gives birth to a set of twins. And it was from that set of twins, one called Paris, that ultimately we see King David and Jesus come from. We live in a world filled with misfits, and the church is filled, it's a place where misfits should be able to find refuge, but God used ordinary people Ordinary, broken, vastly broken people to bring about the birth of Jesus Christ. Some of us lean on our deficiencies, perceived or otherwise. We, we lean on what we say uh, defines us and defines our capability. Well, I don't have a degree hanging on the wall or, or I'm not a great speaker or uh, you know, I, I just think I couldn't handle doing this, that, or the other. If God could use these broken people to bring Jesus Christ, the, the woman who would ultimately birth the Son of God into the world, if, if God can use these broken people, He can sure enough use you. Christmas is a time where we remember the grace of God that has been extended to humanity that though we are broken, though we are deficient, and though we, we're, we're at a loss so many times, God in His grace extends His hand toward us. He extends His power to us and chooses to use us for His glory. That's mind-blowing. It should be mind-blowing anyway. It should be something that gives us a whole lot of great joy. You know, the angel said, good, I bring you good tidings of great joy. The greatest joy that you will ever find today is acknowledging your brokenness. Don't hide your brokenness like culture tells you to do. Don't, don't, don't seek to, to push it to the side and put up the facade that so many of us wear. But acknowledge your brokenness before God. Say, God, I'm broken, I'm deficient, but I want you to use me. Like you've used them. And you know what God will do? He'll use you. He'll use you. Because God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary purposes. He used ordinary, broken, deficient, ill-equipped, in some cases flat-out immoral people to bring about the greatest good that has ever entered the realm of human existence. Mind boggling. I'm going to point you toward one last passage of Scripture before we wrap things up this morning. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When I first began to study, the Bible, I found my way 
to 1 Corinthians. And God used this to help me understand that he uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. I was never someone that thought that I could stand in front of people and talk, and preach, whatever else. That was never where I saw my life going. So when God called me, I said, no, no, no. And I found my way to this passage of Scripture. And Paul, he is just ripping the foundations of this worldly thinking church right out from underneath their feet. These people thought that, that they, they lived in the Greek culture. Greeks, Greeks idolized philosophy. They idolized the wisdom of the world. And Paul says your wisdom doesn't mean squat in the kingdom of God. Listen to what he says in verse 26 of chapter 1. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Stop there. Paul says, God's not calling the wise of this world. He says, God's not calling the mighty of this world, strong, powerful, or otherwise. He says, not, God's not calling the noble of this world. In other words, God doesn't care who you are or where you come from. Doesn't care what family you were born into, what economic status or otherwise. But the Bible says God has chosen. I love those words because that means... And, and what is being declared there is that God has sovereignly ordained that these are the ones that he would use. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak, the weak of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world... And the things which are, what's that next word if you're looking at the scripture with me? Despise. He says, God has chosen the weak. He's chosen the foolish. And he's chosen the despised. Those who are cast out by the world. Those who don't fit the mold of what the world says is usable or valuable or capable. He says... The things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. He says God has not only chosen the weak, the foolish, and the despised. God has chosen the misfits of this world. God has chosen to use misfits. To do great things. And this is the singular purpose behind it. That no flesh. Should glory in his presence. You know Paul also wrote to the Corinthians. He says I have learned. To glory. In my weaknesses. He says I went to the Lord three times. By thorn in the flesh. And God told him. Uh, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my, for my strength is made perfect. In what? Weakness. That no flesh should glory in his presence. You know why God wants to use the people that the world has reckoned are useless, that the world has thrown to the side? Because the less, the less we depend on ourselves, the more we depend on him and the more we depend on him, the more we see that it's his power. It's his capability in us, through us, that's doing the great thing. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him who are in Christ Jesus, who became for us. Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, 
He who glories, let him glory in who? The Lord. God's chosen misfits. He chosen the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Because when he uses the ordinary, there's no question about whom the glory should be given. To whom the glory should be given. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I'll say God. God has chosen misfits. He's chosen broken. He's chosen the people cast aside because it's all about his glory. Jesus came and he, he said, I didn't come for the righteous, but for who? For the unrighteous. He said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but those who are sick need a physician. And he's our great physician. He, he is the one who, who came for the broken, for the hurting, for people who have failed and fallen down. He is interested. He loves, he desires to use those people. He desires to draw us closer to him. Christmas is a time when, you know, we've commercialized everything in our culture today, but it's a time that we think about Jesus. We think about the purpose of Jesus, but it's also a time when we can think about and turn our hearts toward the extraordinary grace of God extended to human beings. Unworthy. Broken. But valuable. In the eyes of God. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, the Bible says there is no respect of persons in him. He is no respecter of persons. But he's come for the ordinary people. It was the most ordinary of people who were the first to see Jesus, who were the ones who, who saw the angels of heaven. The Bible says that the, the heavens filled up as shepherds watched their flocks by night. Shepherds were the outcasts of their day. They spent their time close to, smelling like the animals that they tended. But it was then. God was saying something when those angels declared the birth of Jesus to those shepherds. He was saying, I can't, I have come. Not for those who think they're great. Not for those who think that they've got it all together. But I have come for those who are the outcasts those who are willing to bow their heads, their hearts, and bend their knee to me and call me Lord. Everywhere you look in the Bible, you see people who were misfits, broken because of sin. We see men and women who did extraordinary things, and it wasn't because they were great in and of themselves. It's because it was God allowed to work in them and through them that brought about great things. Christmas, the story of Christmas, is the story of God's extraordinary grace poured out on a world that doesn't deserve it, but thank God He gives it. That so great was is His love for us that while we are yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. For us. That's pretty good news. You hear an amen? amen? Amen. We'll get to working on those amens <laughs> as time goes on. But as you leave here today, I hope that you're not of the mind that God can't use you. Don't let Satan win that argument. Too many people are. A lot of Christians are going to go to their graves having, having never reached their full potential in the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ. All because we measure 
our usefulness to the kingdom by what we perceive, what we reckon we're capable of doing. It's about him. It's about his desire to use you. Let's pray together. We're going to have an invitation him. Our Father, we're thankful this day that we can look at the story of Christmas and everywhere from the first chapter of Genesis to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, we read the story of your extraordinary grace. We read the story of the greatest treasure, the greatest gift that has ever been extended to humankind. And that is the gift of Jesus. Father, the story of Jesus is a story of you using broken people, the misfits of the world, to do extraordinary things. I pray, Father, that our story, each of our individual stories would be wrapped up in Jesus. And Father, we would realize, we would realize our usefulness that we would realize that your ability to use us is not limited by we ourselves, but Father, our ability to be used by you is defined completely and entirely and entirely upon you. Father, I ask that you would minister to hearts and lives this morning. I pray you would encourage us. Father, thank you that you love sinners, that you love broken people. We have all got our junk in our lives. We have all stumbled and fallen, but thank you for grace. We're thankful that you don't throw us away, that you seek to renew and restore us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a short time of invitation. And I hope that if God is dealing with you, if there's something I can pray with you about, I hope that you will do that. We've got deacons all over the place that can pray with you. Uh, we're just going to sing a couple of uh, verses of Just As I Am. And uh, I encourage you, be obedient to the Lord in this time. situations, circumstances that so often we create for ourselves. And Father, you extend your hand of grace and hope and healing. Father, I pray this day that every person here would realize their worth in the kingdom. And Father, we're not 
misfits that are to be relegated away and out of sight and out of mind. But Father, though we are misfits, we are greatly loved and highly favored by you. I pray that every person in this place would know their worth, but Father, also that they would know the love and the joy, the peace that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Help our hearts to stay focused on what matters in this Christmas season. It's in Jesus' name that we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you later this week on Facebook Live. And I want you to do something that you don't often see preachers tell congregations to do. Have you got a cell phone? All right. Get them out. I didn't ask you to get your Bibles out. I didn't get your cell phone. Now, I, know, I know that cell phones are usually attached to hands. If you've got your cell phone, I want you to open up a text message. You know how to send a text message? Well, you're going to show us here in a second. I want you to put my number in a text message, 828 292 3086 and I want you to send a text message with your name on it so I don't wonder about who it is so that I can get people added to my phone book uh, do that also look at the church Facebook page we're going to be doing uh, as much as we can uh, Facebook live on Wednesday nights uh, I hope that you will uh, take a look there and in the next coming weeks I'm going to be collecting some email addresses so that we can uh, get you on an, an email uh, list and, and be able to send those things out. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know it was on the bulletin. <laughs> but send, send your name in that text message so I can add you to the phone, my phone book and make life a whole lot easier and be able to, to get in touch with you folks. But stay safe. Uh, stay connected uh, to one another and to the church, and we'll be praying for you in the meantime. Y'all have a good day.